Viewer discretion is advised because f <laughs> Hello Dungeons of Light and Darkness and welcome to the Realm of Darkness. Video games can be said to be many things. A good way to pass the time, a competitive sport, hell some would even go as far as to call it an art form. But in the end, video games are primarily a form of entertainment, and therefore, they're supposed to be fun. And in most cases, they are. But what about when they're not fun? And I'm not necessarily talking about bad games, either. No, I'm talking about those things. Those small little segments of the game that once you get to them, all of a sudden it stops being entertaining, and becomes more of a painful experience. Now, big disclaimer, this is a very personal list. The following entries on this list are events that commonly occur in video games that deeply upset me. So if you actually like something on this list and I tear it to shreds, then I'm sorry, it's my list. So let's get started. You see, the thing about video games is this. While it is enjoyable to zone out and explore and get lost in whatever new and exciting world the game puts you in, you have to remember that you have a mission, a goal, a task to complete. Therefore, it's only natural that progression towards these goals requires you to move forward, right? No. Enter backtracking, the bullshit that happens when the game developers decide to release their shit on opposite day. It's a pretty straightforward concept. You're progressing through your main quest as usual, but then the game decides to throw you a curveball through some manner of story related bullshit and sends you right back to where you came from. I didn't ask for this! I didn't ask for any of your shit, game! Now, revisiting areas you've already been to isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's not a concept that games seem to know how to execute well enough without it being extremely annoying or just inconvenient. There are games that have done it right. The most notable examples right now being Kingdom Hearts 2, for the most part, and Legend of Zelda games. The reason being that whenever you revisit places in those games, you're not going to be staying there very long. You usually just do it to tie up some ends, pick something up, or drop something off. And on top of that, the places that you revisit are small, and your characters have methods of fast and seamless movement. Then there are other games with large expansive worlds like Skyrim, which have backtracking but are usually covered up by fast travel. But then you have games like Crash, Mind of a Mutant, Paper Mario, and Final Fantasy everything, where you have absolutely no means of fast travel and large worlds that you have to cross over in order to do menial tasks. It wouldn't even be so bad if it didn't feel like a terrible way of padding out the game, that's exactly what it feels like. It's just a bunch of meaningless side stories, detours, and fetch quests. Motherfucking fetch quests! I am so goddamn tired of being your fucking errand boy! Goddamn, I'm trying to save the world! Next on this grand tour of my corrupted psyche is scripted fights, otherwise known as forced failures. These fights go exactly as the name suggests. You're forced to fight something, and you're forced to lose. Happy fun times everywhere! I'm sorry, but isn't the main goal of playing a video game to win a video game? I mean, on the bright side, this isn't necessarily a common control, unless you play RPGs, in which case there is no bright side, because it's in every single one ever. And sometimes in places you would never even expect, making them all the more annoying. Not to say that all the time this gimmick is pulled off and it's done terribly. There are times where it's actually executed really well, and not just in RPGs. Notable examples being the endings to Halo Reach and Red Dead Redemption, and the beginning fight against Bowser in Pure Mario 64. Mostly because you're already aware that your demise is inevitable, and it's just used to make that scene ever more impactful. But I'm talking about those ones. The ones that come out of absolutely nowhere and without warning and have absolutely no reason to exist. The ones that fool you into believing you have a chance and make you waste all your fucking items only for you to die, or for them to drop you down to 1 HP and immediately bring you into another fight on a stretcher. Fuck those ones. They're lies, all of them, I hate it. I'm watching you, Balada. You stupid dick. Alright, tell me if you heard this one. Oh my god, this game's so fucking awesome! Look at all the shit I could do, it's so cool! Oh my god, it's so freaking amazing! Oh my gosh, it's so fun! Wait. Wait, what's happening? What? 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 My shit! Loss of powers. Okay, first, I have to ask, why is this even a thing? Did the developers just one day decide they wanted to be some of the biggest cocktails on planet Earth? 
I know it's probably just a game giving you a preview of all the cool stuff you're gonna get, but the way most games are cute, the shrimp must come off with a big middle finger to the dick. Especially since the reasons they give you for why they're taking away all your stuff is usually illogical. I mean, really. Do you actually expect me to believe that Samus' power suit, the ultimate weapon designed by the Chosen specifically for Samus, that withstands multiple direct hits from creatures like Ridley, water pressure at the bottom of the ocean, and fucking lava, would malfunction because she got flung across a room into a door? Yeah, Samus, definitely the ultimate bounty hunter. What's worse is that this trope is not exclusive to the beginning of games either. You could have hours of the game already invested, and a ton of levels and gear under your belt. And then the game decides to throw you the meanest curveball, and all of a sudden your keyblade is replaced with a wooden sword. A wooden sword that does like 1 HP of damage to everything in the game, at a point in time where everything can pretty much kill you in 3 hits. Then you have to go through a fucking maze with this stupid AI and figure out teleporting puzzles, which nobody likes, and your only method of viable offense is magic, which is now also weakened. You can't even summon things because your previous fucking party members dished you, and Jesus Christ, I fucking hate all of master! Dude, the fuck? <sighs> Sorry, I just... I have some personal problems with that. No, dude, no, 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 it, it's fine, just, just calm down. No, no, I'm cool, I'm cool, just... Just start the next segment. Darkness. Darkling? God damn it, Darkling, get the fuck up. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm awake, what happened? You kind of blacked out from rage. Ah, oh, well that sounds about right. So where exactly am I in the video now? Oh, let's see, um, number seven, number seven... Oh yeah, vehicle segments. Please knock me out again. Look, I don't know how to drive. I probably won't for a while. I stay in my room all day sleeping, eating, and playing video games, so I really don't care about cars. I'm not necessarily the type of guy that will turn down around a Mario Kart, but I'm not exactly too keen on being forced to go out of my element and maneuver a vehicle of any kind when I'm playing a video game that has the majority of its time spent on foot. Vehicle segments in games are just painful because of a combination of many things. The first being that they force you to relearn an entirely different system of gameplay. Once you're already used to traveling on foot or a regular land combat, being sent to the fucking sky to pilot one of these things, or having to drive one of these things, requires you to have to relearn an entire new set of controls. And more often than not, the game will not ease you into this, you're just kind of expected to adapt. They just give you a little dialogue box saying, This is how you do the things. Just proceed to do the things. Oh thanks, game. Love that. The second thing is that it really doesn't help when the vehicle controls like shit, and it usually will. It could be watchdogs and have the car slip around like they're on fucking butter, or it could be Jack 3 and have them be as stiff as cardboard. Being forced to control something is only made worse when it's almost impossible to control it. And thirdly, these segments are unjustifiably short-lived, meaning you have to completely adapt to an entirely new set of rules for a total of 15 minutes, and then you never see it again. What's the point then? Why even include it if you're just gonna brush over it one or two times? It only serves to piss off the player for that short amount of time, and then keep them as salty as a bag of peanuts heading into the next mission. But the only thing that makes these segments worse... ...is when they add racing into it. FUCKING GOD DAMN IT! First I had to readapt for a meaningless challenge. Now I have to readapt for a meaningless challenge IMMEDIATELY! I already don't like racing games because racing itself is kind of boring without a twist added onto it. But now you're forcing me to do it in games that don't need it? That's ridiculous because not only does it bring the stupid problems of regular vehicle segments, but it brings the terrible tropes of racing games as well, like Rubber Band AI and Bombless Bits. And unlike most racing games, which are usually content with you getting at least third place, you're more than likely have to achieve first place in these segments, making it even more annoying when you have to retry them. And if they're anything like the ones in Jack 2, then that means having to redo another 5 whole minutes! That is unless you cut the 5 minutes short when you blow up and die instead of just respawning. And then you have to restart the race. Hey, other people are fucking blowing up but they get to respawn. Why can't we? And if you're gonna do that, why make it so easy to crash into things? This is stupid. Why in the hell did anyone think spontaneous racing segments would be a good idea? Oh, what's that? You were having fun enjoying this game at a decently balanced pace? 
Oops, sorry, gotta go fast, you fucking asshole! Something worse than good protagonists that are crippled by plot are terrible characters that cripple the plot themselves. You know the ones, the ones that are written so terribly. The ones that are either so obnoxiously annoying that Baby Mario crying becomes music to your ears, or the ones that are so bland and uninteresting that you could literally replace them with a brick and nobody would tell the difference. But hey, okay, I guess it doesn't matter too much if some characters are bad. Not everybody can be a Wheatley or a Daxter. But what about when those characters are the main characters? Protagonists in games, or, you know, anything, are generally very important characters. They're the main characters, the central focus of the game, the one you spend the most time with. So obviously, since you're going to be spending the most time with that character, that character shouldn't suck. Now note, silent protagonists don't count. The whole point of silent protagonists are to put the player in the character's shoes. You are supposed to be the protagonist. But there are just some protagonists in games that are so bad that I just wish they stay silent. Some that are just absolute douchebags, and the others that cry a lot and voices so gravely would give Batman a headache. My niece is dead. Shut up, Aiden. This is not really a topic you can go too deep into. It's a pretty simple concept. Protagonists that do terrible things and act in a terrible manner and have absolutely no redeeming qualities whatsoever, and protagonists that are just plain out flat and uninteresting, are in general pretty terrible fucking protagonists. My niece is dead. Shut up, Aiden. The problem with this is that it makes the player feel as if they don't want to play as that character, or if they're stuck as that character, which is bad. It provides a disconnection between the player and the protagonist. Instead of the player wanting to see the character eventually succeed in whatever they're doing, they're more than likely going to be looking for a mute button. Or, you know, just toss the character off a cliff over and over because he fucking deserves it. She's dead! Aiden! Basically, it comes down to this. You're gonna talk, but you say something important or coherent. If I can replace your face with Plank from Ed and Eddie, whatever you're doing, you're doing it wrong. My knees! Shut up! Aiden! Fucking. Fucking suck! Oh yeah, it took a while, but I finally got this guy all figured out. He's low on health, I have full health. Now I just gotta get off one last combo and. Dance, water, dance! Oh! Probably one of the more infamous tropes in gaming. Insta kill moves are not only extremely annoying, but incredibly inconvenient. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the concept of being killed in one hit, but when your game tends to boast a health bar larger than the biggest, blackest dick, it starts to become redundant. It's just a cheap way of bringing up the difficulty levels of otherwise normal or pitiful bosses. It is extremely annoying and should probably stop happening. Again, you won't usually find this trope unless they're playing games like beat em ups or hack and slashes, but when they show up, they're just buzz killer. Now, there are some exceptions to this. Quick time events don't count, most of the time. Because depending on how they're executed in the fight, it's more than likely your fault if you screw it up. But trust me, we'll get to those bastards later. Secondly, difficulty modes that make everything practically kill you in one hit don't count either. Those are there for experts and masochists. The insta-kill moves I'm talking about are the bullshit ones that show up whenever the game feels the need to kick you in the dick at random intervals throughout the fight without warning. Now you could just be shaking your heads and telling me to get good, because most insta-kill moves are easily avoidable or telegraphed. And you'd be right, to a certain extent. But there are even problems with that argument, because 1. To be able to read when an insta-kill move is being telegraphed would require you to know what the telegraph for the insta-kill looks like, and more than likely you would only know that because you were previously killed by the insta-kill move. 2. Not every insta-kill is like that. Some insta-kills, while they have a tell, require extremely fast reflexes to avoid, to the point that they become extremely unfair, or they have weirdly drawn out tells that, that kinda just leave you standing there for 5 seconds waiting for you to stop doing it. Immediately No More Heroes comes to mind. No More Heroes has some of the weirdest choices for insta-kills I have ever seen. Giant crotch laser? Not an insta-kill. Giant cannon laser that could probably consume city blocks? Not an insta-kill. Barrel crying on the ground vulnerable? Insta-kill. Asshole waste time taunting you? Insta-kill. Douche nuts punches you in the face out of a fucking window at the speed of light but absolutely no startup or end lag? Why? <coughs> mm. Where was I? 
reasons why insta kills suck. Number three. Even if you had to disregard all those previous things, insta kills still managed to ruin boss fights. Because there's usually no other challenge, the developers are just satisfied with the one insta kill move and that's it. Because of this, the entire fight, which is usually long, just becomes a game of waiting for the guy to do the thing and then getting out of the way of the thing. Which is bad. And when there is legitimately added challenge on top of the insta kill, it's still probably bad because the devs don't know how to balance the opponent's use of the move. They had to use it too often, which brings up the previous issue. Or use it barely at all, so when it shows up, you fucking panic and most likely blow it three quarters of the way into the fight. Bottom line, insta-kills suck balls and Jasper Bat Jr. can go catch cancer for all I care. A lot of gamers don't like to be told what to do. In fact, most human beings in general seem to have a problem with authority. That's how it goes. So obviously when video games do it, the place is supposed to be your sanctuary, not your goddamn mom, you just tend to give the game a real stern look and then proceed to flip it the proverbial bird. And everybody's peeve is different. For some people it's invisible walls, for others it's spontaneous time limits, but for me, it's stealth missions. You clever little sneak. Always gotta ruin my fun in every game I play, don't you? Now look, I appreciate a good stealth game or a good puzzle game every now and again. I'm all good for slowing it down a bit, I'm not fucking Sonic. But I also appreciate good and consistent pacing in any game I play. And when you have games that focus on high action or exploration that gives you a feeling of constant progress and a genuine keep moving forward attitude, stealth missions are the biggest kick to the dick you could ever put in those games and it kills the pacing like a train wreck. I wanna kill things, not hide like a bitch. And the reasoning for most of these segments usually include coincidences that are all too conveniently timed or contain stupid lazy tropes of their own that didn't have much thought put in them. Oh no, they're gonna raise the alarm and bring more bad guys in that I for some reason can't kill with my guns. Oh no, these particular brands of enemies have the immaculate aim of fucking Zeus and for some reason one shot me if I get seen by them. Instead of, I don't know, just dodging the fucking shots. Oh no, my sword that I'm pretty sure I put away has conveniently, I mean, unluckily, been separated from my person, and now I have to sneak my way past establishment in order to get it back for some reason. And it's not that it can't be done well, most of them are done well. Most! But it's just that it shouldn't be done. Bad pacing is bad, simple as that. And yes, maybe this didn't deserve to be placed so high, but I'm a very impatient gamer, so these annoy me. Like really, why can't I kill you? Why don't you just fight me instead of throwing me in jail, you stupid wimp? Darkness. Told you I'd get to them eventually. Meet the insta-kills infuriating older brother quick time events. Can I just ask a quick question? Who invented these? Like who made these up? These were not the common tropes of my childhood. No, these are a scourge that mankind has developed in secret over the years as gaming has advanced. It's only now that games are relying less and less on these damn things, thank god. But they still exist, and whenever a game at one shows up, the inevitable failures they bring proceed to haunt my nightmares. And for some reason you don't know what a quick time event is, it's basically QUIT PRESS THE BUTTON! There. Now you're dead. Yeah, you see how that can be annoying, right? Just showing in your bed or whatever, having a drink, and going to cutscene. And then all of a sudden, the fucking button shows up on your screen for like a quarter of a second, and then you're dead. And I know what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a way to allow people to interact with the game's cutscenes, fucking immersion or whatever. News flash, I'd be ten times more immersed in the story of the game if I was allowed to watch it at my leisure, instead of actually waiting for an X to show up in the middle of my screen. I mean, what did people really think this would accomplish? Uh, der, I pressed one button and a whole sequence of things happened. Yeah, I definitely feel that like my influence made a serious impact on the outcome of this cutscene. My policy for quick time events is this if you're gonna use them, put them in gameplay. Because there are games that take the concept of quick time events and execute them flawlessly. Two good examples that come to mind being Kingdom Hearts 2 and the God of War series. The reason for this is because in Kingdom Hearts 2, the actions are bound to one button and not a random combination of two or three buttons that are obviously not designed to be pressed in unison. And in God of War, most of the quick time events are a reward for defeating large enemies or a punishment for getting caught in a dangerous move and having to escape as fast as possible in order to sustain minimal damage. And in both cases, the game gives you time. 
enough time in order to execute the action you need to execute. That's great, that's, that's amazing, that's immersion. But when your games have chiefly planned out events that last over 0.5 seconds, just keep your audience awake because you know your game's plot is shit, you are doing it wrong. Alright guys, this is the one you've all been waiting for. The one you guys have seen coming a mile away. A constant recurring trope that has plagued gamers since its dawn. The rage inducing. Nightmare imposing. The one. The only. Ice levels. Yeah, got you there, didn't I? To be honest though, water levels are definitely terrible creatures, but am I the only one who thinks that they've been getting better recently? Like, trust me, I've raged and I've groaned at the water temples of various Zelda games. I've slammed my fist down at the sights of Chemical Plant Zone. Shit like this still bothers me, and I understand why it bothers other people. But I honestly cannot remember the last time I've legitimately hated a water level. It's been so long. Nowadays, water levels have seemed to vastly improve and are executed in very interesting ways. And on top of that, they all look really beautiful and more often than not have elegant and common music. I can still remember going to Skyward Sword's water level completely dreading what awaited me, and then immediately shocked how good it was and how much I enjoyed it. Ice levels, however, I have never enjoyed. I don't recall a single one that I have ever liked in any genre of game. Maybe like one. To me, ice levels are just the worst things, and for three reasons. The first reason, and the one that most likely comes to mind when you think of ice levels, is ice physics. It should be common knowledge to most people that ice has very little friction. And because of this, moving on flat planes of ice will make you slip and slide all over the place without being able to stop on command. So transition that to gaming, and you get the most annoying game mechanic ever. Being subject to ice physics is a completely helpless feeling. It diminishes any control you have over the game and as a result actually hurts itself in the process. In gaming, control is very important and ice physics takes control and throws it out of a window where it proceeds to roll down a hill off a ramp and into a pool of sharks. This is especially annoying in platformers because for some reason developers thought that levels with no friction would be perfect levels to implement level design that require tight and precise platforming segments. The second reason why I hate ice levels is because frankly, they all look the fucking same. Which wouldn't be bad if they all didn't look boring. Now you can argue that point, that's quite alright. I know some people who would say the exact opposite. You could say that all ice levels, even though they follow one particular theme, being ice, are varied in their art and level design and more often can make you exhibit feelings such as wonder or mystery or fear, while generally just looking beautiful. I have no qualms with that, I can see where you're coming from, but here's what I think when I see an ice level. It's white. It's white! It's fucking white everywhere, that's it! Coming from a tropical country, I have never seen snow before, but I hope it looks better in real life than it does in these fucking shit. Every single one is just a frosted sheet of perpetual white and transparency. And the themes that ice levels seem to bring are unvaried and uninspired. You got your mountains, and you got your caves. That's it. There are very few actually unique settings for ice levels in these games. Take Freeze Flame Galaxy from Super Mario Galaxy, for example. That is the most aesthetically beautiful ice level I've ever played, and I've played a lot of them. And the sad part about that is that it's only half ice. The other part is fire, and to be honest, I think I prefer the fire side. But the last reason why I absolutely abhor ice level is the absolute painful experience of having to endure another motherfucking ice block puzzle! What the fuck? Holy shit! I absolutely fucking hate ice block puzzles with the white hot burning intensity of a thousand suns! They are by far, personally to me, the worst things about ice levels! They're not even that common, they're not even that common, but I've seen enough of these bastards for them to be immediately associated with the trope. They're in pretty much every single Zelda game ever, and even in some RPGs. And not a one was done well! Except for like, one in Mario and Luigi Dream Team. And even then it was boring and frustrating because turning Luigi to change the weather takes like 5 seconds of pure waiting every fucking time! Move the blocks in a certain pattern in order to hit the switch, in order to unlock a door, in order to go to the next room, which has another bloody ice block puzzle! It shouldn't count! As a puzzle, it's not smart, it's not clever, it's just not fucking fun. This also goes for every ice-related Pokemon thing in the world. News Flash, stepping on ice and immediately locking your momentum in one direction until you hit a wall is not ice physics. And those don't even have anything to do with blocks, they're just 
bad puzzles. Bad, tedious, tedious puzzles. So I guess in the end, it's just the entire concept of puzzles that revolve around ice physics that bothers me. Yes, it could just be that I'm utter garbage at them, and I am, but that doesn't change the fact that I think that they are terrible, terrible excuses for puzzles in gaming. Who the fuck the all this shit anyway? What, do you think I'm playing chess? You think I have time to sit around for minutes trying to make concrete strategies and plan out multiple moves ahead of time to open a fucking door? I got a fucking key? It's just pushing a block onto a switch! How the hell could you go fuck that up? Dude, calm down, you're freaking out again. I know, I know. I hate this shit. Anyway guys, this has been Dorky the Second. Do the whole YouTube shiz and- What are you doing? I'm closing out, we're done here. No, we're not. Yes, we are, John. Dude, come on. <laughs>
Funnily enough, however, the lowest rank you can get and the one you start off with is a C minus. I guess Nintendo couldn't resist making everyone feel like a winner, even though your inkling cries if you lose. Bioshock Infinite, why can't more games be like you?